Columbia University Faculty of Science Alumni Association, CAFSA, proudly presents a distinguished speaker series to uplift the knowledge of aspiring students and budding scientists in the Faculty of Science at the University of Colombo and Sri Lanka as well. In this series of lectures, CAFSA features accomplished scientists and key opinion leaders in different science streams to present the advancement in their field of expertise. This seminar series is a collaborative effort between CAFSA and the Columbia University Faculty of Science. Welcome to the distinguished speaker. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, from wherever you are joining us today. <clears throat> My name is Vasundra Fernando, representing the CAFSA, and I will be the moderator for today's talk. First of all, on behalf of the CAFSA Distinguished Speaker Series Subcommittee, I warmly welcome you all for today's talk. I'd like to remind you that this talk will be broadcasted on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel simultaneously. There will be a Q&A session, and I invite you to type your question in our Zoom chat on our Facebook page or on, our, on the YouTube comment section at any time, and we will direct your questions to our speaker uh, at the end of the talk. Today, we have uh, Dr. Bino De Silva, and she's going to tell us about developing a career as a scientist in pharmaceutical industry. <clears throat> Dr. Binod De Silva, the former vice president of Bristol Myers Squibb Company, Princeton, New Jersey, is now working as the lead discovery and optimization at Bristol Myers Squibb. She is responsible for leading the high throughput screening, lead optimization, reagent generation in the small molecule discovery organization. Dr. De Silva has broad and extensive expertise in the drug discovery and development processes where she spent the early years in the, in the regulated bioanalytical function, moving to support CNC analytical for manufacturing and the more recent experience in early drug discovery screening. She received her bachelor's in analytical chemistry from the University of Colombo in, in 1987 and PhD in chemistry in 1994 from the University of Kansas. She was a postdoctoral research associate in the pharmaceutical uh, chemistry department at the University of Kansas from 1994 to 1995. She was at Procter & Gamble Pharmaceuticals, Norwich, New York from 1995 to 2000 and at Amgen, Thousand Oaks, California, leading the bioanalytical team from 2001 to 2010. She joined Bristol Myers Squibb in November 2010. Dr. De Silva was a, past was a past president of the American Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists. In addition, she is a member of the American Association, American Chemical Society, Association for uh, Women in Science, and the Healthcare Business Women Association Metro Chapter. Uh, she has been an active participant uh, developing bioanalytical guidance, collaborating with the industry and regulatory colleagues, and was a member of the Programming Committee for Multiple Crystal City Workshops and Steering Committee of the Global Bioanalytical Consortium representing the North America. Dr. De Silva has published ex extensively on the topic of validation of ligand binding assays use of emerging technologies to enable bioanalysis, scientific data-driven decision when validating or regulated support in peer-reviewed journals. She has authored multiple book chapters on bioanalytical methods validation. She has received many awards and accolades such as the 2020 American so <clears throat> Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists Distinguished Service Award, the 2020 Sino-American Professionals Association Distinguished Achievement Award, 2018 Healthcare Business Women Association Luminary, 2017 Clinical and Pharmaceutical Solutions Through Analysis Distinguished Scientists, 2015 Wisdom Share International Mentor of the Year. She also serves on a couple of scientific advisory boards for contract research associations. 
Her passion is to solve analytical problems and to inspire junior scientists to unleash their full potential. So without further ado, Dr. De Silva, with great pleasure, I invite you to tell us about your developing, about developing a career as a scientist in the pharmaceutical industry. Thank you, Vasundara, for that lovely um, uh, introduction. Um, so hopefully, And see your screen. Yeah. And now can we can you see, see it, right? And we can hear right. you too. Okay, wonderful. So good morning, good evening. And I really want to thank the um thank Kufsa, uh the organizing committee for this distinguished uh, scientist uh, speaker series for inviting me. I'm truly humbled and truly grateful for this opportunity to share my experiences with you. Um, I will focus on the science at a high level given the diverse audience uh, that may be participating. Then I will share my experience in the farm and the biotech industry um, and the key learnings. Now, just to uh, put everything into context, my talk will be focused more on the US pharma industry and um, my experiences um, in, in the industry. So let's start uh, from the highest level. The FDA, Food and Drug Administration, is the highest uh, central governing body that approves the therapeutic drugs that could be marketed in the United States. There are other regulatory bodies who govern other countries. If you take a look at the past 25 years, the FDA has approved on an average about 30 to 40 drugs uh, per year. Now, if you really think about the grand scheme of things, this is very, very small. Um, we can't take the last couple of years into consideration because that was unprecedented time for the FDA for approving more than 50 drugs. But in, if you really look at the diseases that are there, this is, not, um, this is not a great statistic, right? And among the drugs approved by the FDA, if I take a snapshot of this from 2021, most of these drugs are small molecules. So about 70% of the drugs currently approved by the FDA and other regulatory bodies is about is small molecules. They can have multiple functionalities and everything, but um, they are small molecules. About 25% of these, um, about 25% of the drugs are biologics and then mostly they are monoclonal antibodies or antibody drug conjugates. The past few years, people have been exposed to the mRNA technologies and gene therapy and cell therapy. They are still a very small portion of these approvals. So why is this um, such a, a big deal, right? Because the drug discovery and development process takes 10 to 12 years to the cost of about one to two billion US dollars. This is a long process with many accomplishments, but also failures. In the early discovery, there is a um, target identification. So if you take the drug discovery process, I'm not going to go into all the details here, we'll cover some of it later. Early drug discovery is really understanding the target, um, understanding what, what are the hits of those targets. And then you go into preclinical studies where you are looking at animals and uh, using these uh, drugs to really test uh, what, whether it is safe. Then we go into the clinical development phase, which can, which can be long because there are other um, factors that need to be taken into account as safety, efficacy, patient populations, dose escalation. So this takes about six to seven years. Then we also file this, then we file the drug with the uh, FDA or other uh, regulatory authorities. 
And then uh, it takes a couple of years to get approved with the launch. And then once you launch a drug, people think it's done. It's not. It takes a long time more to really understand the post marketing surveillance. Now, if you think about it, as it is launched, it's going into my diverse populations. So there are other things that you really need to think about drug drug interactions, other activities. But most importantly, when you file a drug, it is to a certain group of people, say it's for adults, right? So what if we want to use this drug in a pediatric population, we need to uh, do more clinical studies. So all this happens after the drug is launched and it is uh, considered post-marketing commitments. So let's take an example of a small molecule uh, drug. So when we have, um, when we have, are looking for drugs in the small molecule, most of our companies have what we call compound libraries. Now there are about two and a half million to five million compounds that we have in our compound libraries that we will take and screen, what we call screen, to identify a molecule or a class of molecules that may be binding to a target, uh, interrogating a protein and such. So if you take uh, the small molecule process, it's like a funnel. We have these millions of compounds that we screen and bring into drug discovery. Then these screens get further uh, modified to understand whether they have structure activity relationships. And once they are identified, then it goes into preclinical studies and then into clinic. Now, there are a lot of drugs that fail in the clinic. Usually, we take about one drug to the clinic, and there are multiple backups in there that we have selected. But um, it can be uh, rejected for safety, for efficacy, and so much. So if you really think about this, this funnel with tens of thousands of compounds in the beginning, at the end of the day, it is only one drug that is being approved by the FDA or other regulatory agencies. Okay, so let's look at some of the activities that are happening. A typical hypothesis in any disease stage will be you are either inactivating a protein, activation of a protein, inhibiting a target. There's some hypothesis that we will be testing. A good target needs to be able to be druggable. Otherwise, it's no point developing a drug. A good molecule needs to be efficacious, safe, and meet the clinical and the commercial needs. So to get to that place in the early discovery phase, we do high throughput screening, it could be a phenotypic screen, it could be a target-based screen, it could be a structure-based drug design. Irrespective um, of what the process we use, we really screen these molecules to identify molecules that bind a target. There could be a variety of assays that are being used, both in vitro and in vivo, to uh, identify these drugs, drug candidates. Then we go into preclinical evaluation where you're using some of those uh, drugs, that drug molecules that we have identified in the discovery phase to go into animal models to test for pharmacokinetics, pharmacology, dose ranging studies, cross-reactivity and toxicology. Once we know that the drug is safe in animal models, we file what we call an IND, Investigational Drug Application to the FDA. Now, we are, we, at that point, what we are asking the FDA is to please let us go into humans. So once we go file this and it is approved, then we go into clinical development. Now, clinical studies are essential to determine the treatment is safe and effective in humans. So there are mainly three phase, um, phases before you submit an application. Phase one is safety and clinical pharmac early clinical pharmacology, mostly done in healthy volunteers. Now, um, here, sometimes we don't use healthy volunteers for like a cancer drug or so, but um, it's mostly uh, healthy volunteers in general. Uh, the phase two is initial efficacy and safety and can in, in, and in patients to really understand the proof of the concept. Phase three is comprehensive efficacy studies, drug-drug interaction study, special population, renally impaired, uh, kidney, um, 
and then other, other uh, heart conditions. I mean, you look at special populations to make sure that this is safe. Once we get the data from phase one to phase three, we submit uh, to the FDA, the NDA, or the new drug application. Once the drug is approved, then we go into phase two, like I said, the post-marketing studies to look at the large, large diverse populations. So if you're looking at the regulatory approval and the launch, how many of you have taken a bottle of Tylenol or Panadol or whatever um, drug that it have read that label? I would challenge all of you to go read that label because every single thing, um, determination in that drug facts label has data that was approved by the FDA. So that drug labeling is so critical. There are multiple review processes or we sometimes we also go into review meetings with the regulatory authorities to make sure that they understand what we say is data driven, okay? So it'll be interesting, go, re go read that drug label. So once the review meetings are over, the FDA goes and uh, inspects the facility to make sure that we are producing that drug in under good manufacturing practices and really is safe to be done. So this is a huge pre-approval pre inspection of a facility is so critical for our uh, launch and uh, marketing. And then we get the drug approved. So I did a very big brush stroke of the drug development process to get us going into what, what we are doing. So this is for a small molecule drug. Um, and then, so going forward, right, um, as, I, as I concentrated on the small molecule drugs here, there are multiple new tools and approaches that is available. There's gene therapy that is coming for very debilitating diseases. Um, and we are, uh, we are, the technology has improved so much to edit the genes, to really take out that gene that is causing the disease and to put it back into patients. Cell-based cell therapies is coming up for, again, for people who don't have those um, uh, RNA that is in your, um, in your body to produce the protein or those cells to be produced. So these are all the new tools and approaches. All of you who are looking for jobs can really focus your attention on and really get um, a good place in, in the industry. So most of my talk is, was really on the industry, but even the academy, academia, these are some of the new tools that is coming up. I'm not underestimating the value of the biologic therapeutics and the small molecules, but th there's a whole new area that is not exploited in the drug discovery and development process. So that's kind of majorly the science part of uh, the talk. So I hope, you know, maybe it was too simple for some of you, but I wanted to keep it at a high level to get to where the career development becomes important. As you saw, there are multiple steps in the drug discovery development process. So it's a team sport. And you can see there are as, as you can imagine, there are many, many disciplines that are needed to discover and develop a drug, to be a drug hunter. And what is our North Star in the industry of a drug discovery and drug development is to get that drug approved and give it to the patients who are suffering grievous illnesses. So what does it take to be a drug hunter? What it takes is to be a, have a growth mindset and to be a lifelong student, to be curious, to know who or what is really real. What do you know, what you don't know, okay? So I would um, encourage all of you to read some of this work by David Rock about growth mindset. It is very, very, interesting, but really goes into what holds us from getting to that next step. So when you have a growth mindset, your challenges are you're embracing those challenges. 
And you are never going to say give up easily. You persist in the face of setbacks. Think about your experiments that you're doing as an undergraduate, as a graduate student. How many times do we fail? Probably 90% of the time. We pull ourselves back, design our next experiment. And the effort that you put in, every effort, no matter what it is, even if it is a simple task, see that effort as a path to mastery. Criticism and feedback, take it to learn. I mean, I'll go a little bit into feedback in a little bit, but take it to learn. And then embrace and celebrate the success of others and also find lessons that inspire you in those successes. It is so critical that we take some of the things and learn from others as well. So when you have a growth mindset and you're going to be a student as a lifelong student, you will really have the free, free will to have a fulfilling career. So going into my uh, self-discovery and development process. So um, I look at being a drug hunter, I look at self-discovery and development process parallels drug discovery and drug development. I hope uh, some of you uh, find that um, as well. So in our early self-discovery, so this is a very simplistic look at our life. There's, life is much more complicated than this. So it's, if you look at the self, early, early self-discovery, it is our childhood and our formative years where we really believed in everything that our parents taught us, the values, our parents, family, teachers, play a critical role in this development. How we play, how we interact with our friends, all that create that foundation of you as a person. And then as we um, enter into our um, early, um, ad uh, early adulthood uh, or early, early, earlier adulthood, we have to understand our safety of our dreams. Remember, we are, um, hold on one second, I lost my pointer here. Um, um, we, um, we really have dreams of getting very, very idealistic dreams. I want to be a doctor, I want to be an engineer, I want to be this, that, and the other thing, right? So early, early um, in our careers. Then as we go into our undergraduate years and such, we kind of get a little bit more confidence. We know a little bit more and we are developing the proof of concept of the career. We may want to be a scientist. We want to be a dancer, singer, musician, or we want to be a teacher. Whatever it is, that's your uh, proof of concept because that really hones you to say, okay, this is the area that I'm going to go in. And as we, as we launch into our mid-career, we have gained a lot more confidence, a lot more courage, and we are approval of the career that we are taking. So, and we try to learn, um, learn from that and then really get into what is more of that role of what we are going to do, right? And then when we, we take off, we are taking it off, like what, what can we give back to this world? So it's really important that in this launch phase and then you are at the top of your career, you're really doing well and you are the master of everything. So that's really, really important at that time. And then as you get to my age, you understand that we all have an expiration date. It's not about the expiration date of what you, what, who you are, but what you have learned. So you try to retool yourself. You try to gain different other ex additional experiences to say, what is it can I achieve now and go back and maybe have a second or third career? Now, why is this important? If you want to be fulfilled, happy, and passionate about yourself, you need to take charge. You need to be the CEO of your career. So let's look at um, what are some of the things that we may have, we may be doing. In the early days, be the technical expert you can be. 
be a sponge, learn everything, interdisciplinary curriculum as much as possible. And also participate in conferences, forums where you can learn from others and you have to know the new trends in your field because that is this is the time that you're really showcasing what you can do to be an expert in your discipline. Mid-career. This is where most of us will be for a long period of time. So in the early career, you are being an individual in some ways, learning the ropes. In the mid-career, you also need to understand some of the strategy and the people management aspects. And you're thinking of as a team. You want to win as a team for that organization. You want to coach and build that team. And then you're looking at how do you belong in the big picture, right? So, and what is really holding us back from what I have seen uh, from um, my 30 year career here is feedback. This is a very vulnerable stage for most of us. We really in, in that pivotal point of launching, uh, taking that launch and having confidence and sometimes a lack of courage. And what feedback will do you, it's a gift. Receiving and giving constructive feedback, you had to learn how to receive feedback as well as get, getting uh, giving feedback. You grow from this because sometimes at this stage we are confident and a little bit too confident, and we don't we take that feedback personally. Take it to grow, grow from this critical feedback and embrace them. Then, as you go into the senior leadership, so now you're going from that individual to your team to your enterprise your company your university this is also another little bit of a vulnerability here because you have to be so self-aware you are no longer the subject matter expert you are there to create a vision a mission and objectives for a larger multifunctional organization and i'm going to quote nalin here because we had a prior conversation before the talk start. He is thinking of how to get the university to be the best and the department to be the best. So he was creating that vision mission for the department. That's a very tangible um, uh, goal. But if you don't, if you're stuck in your own, um, being a subject matter expert and thinking only of that without thinking about the big picture, you cannot rise to that senior leadership level. And the importance of fiscal responsibility. It's not just money, because when we always say fiscal responsibility, we think about money. It's not fiscal, it's not just money. It's also the time and the resources. Keep an open mind, accept diverse and creative ideas because you cannot grow as a senior executive or a senior leader without accepting diverse ideas. And be the key change agent. If you are afraid of change, this is not the place to be. You re there's a lot of change that happens. And if you're not the a key agent that you're driving that change, um, this level of leadership could be difficult. So um, what does not change at any level, be, whether you're a technical expert, mid-career or senior leadership is having that growth mindset. Be curious, have a mindset of a student. So I, I want to tell you what I didn't, I wish I knew. I was lost when it came to finances um, because I didn't really pay attention or didn't know at that time when I was in graduate school to take a few business classes. And when I went to a, a industry, I didn't know how to read a profit and loss statement. So I wish um, I knew that. So I, I'm hoping that all of you who are looking into careers be it academic, be it industry, learn a little bit of the business environment in your early career, because then it's easier for you to shape that uh, mid and senior level careers of that. If you're going into a regulated industry like the pharma industry, pay attention to the regulatory training. I went to a university for my graduate school that provided us ample opportunity to work 
uh, with uh, regulatory authorities and FDA speakers were brought in. We were taught good laboratory and clinical and manufacturing practices. We didn't really pay attention at that time. And then I was thrown into the industry and boy, wasn't it a, um, uh, was, wasn't it a surprise what I didn't know. And then the importance of time. Time is money. Time is revenue to the industry. Time is revenue to the academics. So time is money. Um, I know most of you are probably graduate students or undergraduate students. And when your professor tells you to give that paper in six weeks, you give it to him or her in uh, six months. If you do that in the industry, that's a lot of dollars and rupees and whatever spent. So take, make, take, take the importance of time. Um, and, you know, all of us think we know that, um, but we don't. All right, so moving more into my personal um, career, um, I call this a conscious choice of my career journey. No matter what we do, we, uh, we take conscious choices. So um, as most of you know, I was born and raised in uh, Sri Lanka. I went to the University of Colombo. Um, and got um, my chemistry degree from there. And I will give a few examples here and there where uh, pivotal points in my career. Um, when we were selected to the um, special degrees, I got botany zoo and chemistry. And when I looked at my chemistry badge, I was the only woman. So I decided I was going to go into uh, botany. Madame Pereira was uh, the dean at that time. I got, a, I got a message, I have to go see her. Wow, you know, when you get called to the dean's office, you are not very happy. So she called me in and said, chemistry is the central science of everything. So you're going into chemistry, you're not doing botany. So I was, I did chemistry special, and then I uh, had the opportunity to come to Kansas. And there again, there was a pivotal point there as well. When I reflect back 30 years, what my professor told me was so critical. I uh, joined a professor, Professor George Wilson, who was a electrochemist. I knew I was not going to do electrochemistry. Um, sorry, um, Sumedha, you taught me electrochemistry in, uh, in, in, the, in undergraduate. No offense to you, but I knew I wasn't going to do uh, electrochemistry. So, um, I was going to do analytical, but he called, he told us, not just me, he told all of us that there's nothing called pure analytical chemistry in the future. Go combine that chemistry degree with anything in the life sciences and you will have a good career. Now, when you think about that, this was 30 years ago, he had the vision to tell us what to do at that point. So I went and learned immunology, combined it with my analytical chemistry degree, um, while the degree is in chemistry, but the background that came up, came with that immunology is what I carry even today um, with my career. My first job was at Procter & Gamble Pharmaceuticals, a very traditional large company. And in that was the pharmaceutical division, which was small. Um, great learning experience of how to have the first regulatory experience in, in PNG. Um, a quick story there, I was weighing out a powder and I wrote it on a little napkin and um, my uh, colleague at the bench said, you're pasting that piece of paper on the notebook. I'm like, what? No, I can write, rewrite it. And she's like, no, because that's raw data. That's what I said. If I paid attention in Kansas to regulatory, I would have known that's raw data. So there you go. You learn from everyone. Then as PNG was uh, exiting uh, large molecule uh, pharmaceutics, I wanted to go into uh, large molecules. So I went into, I took a job at Amgen, which was cross country. So moved myself to California. And Amgen was a small biotech where I had an absolute blast because you can be, one day you can be a research scientist at the bench, you can be in front of a project meeting. So you get the whole experience of that biotech environment. Um, six and a half years after, uh, sorry, nine and a half years after uh, Amgen, I moved back to the East Coast to take a job at Bristol Myers Squibb. I have to say that I was totally blessed in Bristol Myers Squibb because I got to do the entire drug discovery and development process at Bristol Myers Squibb the last 12 years. So now 
I left Bristol in October this year. I'm currently at that point of retooling myself and taking a break from a 30 year career. And what I did there was, you know, retooling. I, I, I'm not just preaching to all of you. I went back to school in the summer. I took a course in Rutgers University because I have a passion of really training and coaching junior scientists. So I went back to school this summer and took a, took a, a certificate course in uh, leadership coaching and organizational change. So maybe that's my career uh, for right now. I'm having a blast until I take on my next adventure. So if I reflect on the diversity of these experiences, what it is, is you are a mentor, you're a sponsor, you're a coach. My hardest transition was from being a bench scientist to a manager, but I loved it because I embraced that change and I really liked the fact that I was able to provide, direct the science through other people. Innovation. Time is money. Patients are waiting. Don't waste it. So this is another reflection that I have. We really need to get, be nimble, flexible, and really put those drugs on the market so that the patients can have it. Teamwork, I cannot stress the importance of teamwork. I'm going out in a limb here, and some people may not agree with me, but I'm going to tell you that the success in your career is not just your IQ. In emotional quotient, EQ plays a huge role in developing your uh, teamwork activities and being part of a team, working in a team. And I had the opportunity to work with the FDA to develop some guidance, and I will never ever forget those experiences. That's so, so critical. And COVID also, I was leading a lab at the time of COVID. So learning from those experiences, what you had to do and the empathy, the different aspects of things you had to think about to get that work done, to come to the lab, everything was really a big experience in my career. Now, the biggest and the most difficult experience is being a parent. There's no instruction manual, the experience is the hardest and the most rewarding. Why do I bring this here? It is important because you're whole. You're a whole person. Your home work needs to be in balance. There's nothing called work-life balance, but being a parent and really understanding what it takes to bring and nurture that child brings, gives you so many experiences that you can apply in the workplace. The next is paying forward. I want you to leave with the importance of paying it forward. Be part of a community. It is very important. As you have seen, drug hunting and other jobs are a team sport. You want your tribe, you want your clan. Join your alumni associations, mentor, coach, share your experiences. Take part of scientific advisory boards and then servant leadership. Servant leaders, really are what we need today. It is not about you, it's about the community. It's about paying it forward and it is about really showing what you can do to, um, ex, you know, to take this society to the front. So I'm gonna leave you with a relevant quote. Why? Because you are the CEO of your um, career. It's a quote from Buddha. No one saves us but ourselves. No one can and no one may. We ourselves might walk that path. If you have an open mind, be curious, be a lifelong partner, lifelong learner, you will reach your highest potential. You will have a fulfilling career and a life. So I'm going to show you the real two who keep me honest every single day, teach me something new um, that I'm learning. This is the gen... Z's and the um, Y's. So they teach me some new things every day that I take to work and to my life. Um, there are some, there, here are some of the references um, that, I mean, you will have these slides. Um, and then that's my contact information for any questions. Um, if you don't get 
uh, to ask today. And I'm actually leaving to Sri Lanka, 25th of November. We'll be there for a little bit. If anyone wants to um, call me, I'm, I'll be there uh, for those of you. So thank you very, very much for this opportunity. I hope you were able, you will be able to take at least a couple of tips from this and have a fulfilling career. Uh, thank you, Dr. De Silva, for the great talk. It was very informative. I myself, as someone from a pharmacy background and in drug discovery research, I really appreciate all the tips and everything you shared with us today. Okay, so it's open for questions now. Uh, while you get your questions ready, let's go through a few questions raised uh, on our Zoom chat and also on other uh, electronic platforms. Um, we have a question, it's actually, actually two parts. I'll probably uh, read out the first part of the questions to you. Um, you describe the drug discovery process and only a very small percentage of compounds get to the uh, finish line. You said many fails due to toxicity. What can you say about natural product compounds and their success rate? So I'm, I, unfortunately, I'm not uh, an expert on nat natural um, products, but any drug that needs to go through the process of really understanding the structure, activity relationships, and then the clinical trials. Um, I think Sir is on the line, um, Prasitila Karatna. Um, so any 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 drug that whether it's a natural product or a, a chemical pharmaceutical has to go through some of the testing processes that will govern it from becoming a drug. Animals in vitro studies, animal studies, clinical studies. So I don't know the rate of um, success in the natural products, but um, maybe someone else has that experience with natural products. Um, I don't know what the what the rate success rate is on that on those. Or it, it it has to be safety and efficacy at the end of the day. It doesn't matter what what kind of drug it is. Yes. Okay, so the second part of the question uh, is, as Sri Lankans, we have used various Ayurvedic medicine throughout our life with success. Any thoughts on how we can methodologically investigate the active ingredients of these natural compounds as drug candidates? So once again, it's, it's going through really, you know, um, going through your analytical experiments, right? So you really need to find out what is that, what is the chemical matter that is the active ingredient. That, that's the key, doesn't matter what it is, right? What is that active ingredient that either affects a target, binds a target, modulates a protein that affects diseases. So the fundamentals are the same, right? The fundamental is what is that active ingredient and what is the, what is the protein or the target that it's binding to? So, I mean, I, all of us do take Ayurvedic medicines and it's coming through um, our heritage and our ancestry. I'm, I'm sure there's some um, pharmacological activity and the pharmacolog pharmacological effect is what we need to investigate again. Okay, thank you. And um, another question we have, uh, how important the role how important the role the teamwork and various collaborations played in your career success. And there's a second part again, having a very successful career and also being a minority and a woman, what career advice you give to aspiring young Sri Lankan woman? Good question. Um, once again, what, you know, I was just like all of you, um, an individual contributor, you know, when I graduated um, from undergraduate as well as um, mostly from a graduate student, I thought I was the queen on the top of the hill, right? You know, because you are so good at what you did in graduate school and you go to a company. My, my first job was a company and you quickly realize what you don't know. It is really important to know that because I was a bioanalytical chemist who knew my immunology, but that was such a small part of the entire drug development process. So 
if you are really open-minded and really understand what you can learn from others in that team, that's the most important thing as a first job. So as I said, the team, the, a project team in my case, or my experience, it's a project team who have pharmacokinetics, statisticians, analytical chemists, mass spectrometrists, everybody, right? So if you don't embrace that team um, understanding and the learning, it's very difficult to move on in the pharmaceutical industry. So that's one thing. So what I tell um, uh, students is that, so you have your expertise. What are the adjacencies to that expertise? So for me, like, let's say my analytical experience, I was supporting pharmacokinetics. I was support. So I need to learn a little bit of pharmacokinetics. I need a little, learn a little bit of pharmacodynamics. And then how do these things uh, come up with understanding dose ranging? So those are the adjacencies that we can learn and then learn that uh, big picture activities. And you can do that only through team work. Being a minority and a woman, um, that's a whole nother topic. I don't know if any uh, the person who wants to talk to me later, I can go into more detail. It's persistent. It's knowing what you need to know, being confident about yourself. So um, I didn't go into too much detail. I have three C's that govern my career, confidence, courage, and community. Confidence is really knowing what you have to do to know your expertise, understanding, being thorough, being really thorough with what your expertise is. And the courage, you need to take some risks. You have to have the courage to take the risks. Sometimes you fail, you pull up, pull it, pull up from your bootstraps and really uh, get going. And the other is community. You have to find your tribe. You have to find your clan, because they are the ones who will pull you up. Kufsa, my, 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 my tribe was AAPS, American Association for Pharmaceutical Scientists. So learning from them was also a huge resource for me, right? So your, your teachers, your, your, your tribe. So those are the three things that will get you through any being a minority, being a woman, um, um, that will get you through your confidence, courage, and your community. Okay, thank you, Dr. De Silva. Uh, another question. Uh, can you briefly explain to a layman about the role of biologics in the pharma industry and the role of a chemist uh, in the biological manufacturing industry? Oh, so so when I talk about biologics, I grew up in the antibody era. So I'm um so right now, even antibodies, uh, antibody drug conjugates, proteins. When I say proteins, mostly enzyme replacement therapies. Um, and now the new new ones that are coming in the RNA, DNA, uh, gene therapy, and so so that's what I talk about biologics. That's what I when I when I say biology, those are the biologic therapies that I'm talking about. Um, so they also go through the same um, process, not as much as the high throughput. There's no high throughput screening in the biologics. It's more of the structure activity relationships, the binding properties, receptor occupancy. Those are some of the um, characteristics that we will be using to determine the drugs. And then as we move in the preclinical and the clinical, most importantly, it will be, um, be pay attention to immunogenicity because, you know, think about uh, your mRNA vaccine, you get it, you want an antibody response, but for a protein therapeutic, you don't want that antibody response because it'll uh, diminish the efficacy. So make sure that you um, understand those things. Now coming in a chemist in the manufacturing process, it's huge, it's chemistry, it's scale up, it's process chemistry. You need to know, yes, it will be fermentation versus chemical manufacturing uh, of a small molecule, but a chemist, is you, you are multidisciplinary. So you the anal, analytical work, um, there may not be synthetic chemists, but you have process chemists. You need to learn how to scale up your process. So there's a lot of um, opportunities as a chemist in the manufacturing of biologics. Great, thank you. Uh, another question we have, uh, do you have to always have a chemistry undergraduate degree to become a scientist in pharma industry? Mm -hmm. No, you saw the, you, I, I showed the uh, multitude of uh, occupations that you can get from, you know, you can be a lawyer, we need lawyers. I mean, we need the patent lawyers, we need 
We need salespeople. We need business people. So, I mean, we need everybody. You do not need to have a chemistry degree or a science degree. You can have a business degree um, and uh, come into uh, the pharma industry. Thank you. Um, so uh, one last question before um, we uh, conclude the session. Um, pharma industry is always under heavy compliance with regulatory requirements such as USP and CGMP. What can we learn by ourselves by uh, reading or online courses to a these regulatory documentation experience? So you are, all of you are growing up in the era of the internet. So there are so many um, valuable information on the internet, but FDA website, fda.org, the FDA website has so much um, information and instructional activities. So I would say go to the regulatory websites. They have um, webinars and such, but also not just uh, FDA, EMA has it, MHLW, that's the Japanese. They have on their websites, um, all, all the information. So I would really, I mean, there's a lot on YouTube and everything, but I would go directly to some of those websites to learn um, some of the activities. Um, and if you guys want to send me an email, I'll, sh I'll shoot you the websites, uh, whoever wants. So I know you said that was the last question. Was I, there are, I, I once again, there, there is another one. one. Last question. Oh, okay. Sorry, it looks like it's a very popular topic today. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Thanks a lot for the great talk. That's a compliment. Uh, I have recently heard from uh, an entrepreneur in USA that in many businesses, a major part of business is dealing with regulation or of course regulators. Do you have any thoughts about that um, from your specific experience or instances that you can talk about in public? Okay, can, can you can you repeat it again? I, I got I lost the middle part of it. Oh, um, I have recently heard from uh, an entrepreneur in USA that in many businesses, a major part of a business is dealing with regulation uh, or regulators. Uh, that part. Yeah, yeah, that, which is true. So, um, so we start up in the preclinical. Um, time when we submit the IND. So it's good to make sure that you have a, a relationship with the regulators to really understand what, what the toxicity of it is. And then when it comes to the NDA, filing the NDA, there's a lot of interactions. Now, I, um, uh, you know, I, had, I had experience in uh, submitting applications as well as uh, in, the, in the determination of the guidance document, which is true. It is a lot of interactions and it is specific for your drug. It is, they really hone in on the scientific aspects of the drug because of the, of the drug label. So that's where we get interaction. I can't talk specifics, but that's where it comes in that the drug, determining the drug label is so critical. That's the majority of the time we spend time with the regulators. Okay. I can go into more detail um, if someone wants. Yes, thank you, Dr. Binon. So if you have any more questions, I'm pretty sure Dr. Uh, Priscilla is more than happy to uh, help you with the questions. And there are lots of compliments uh, on the chat uh, section I can see. Uh, so moving forward, um, we always would like to hear from you and uh, I think Vasundra, you're muted for some reason. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Uh, yeah, so yes, I was yes. I was telling that we'd like to hear from you. And then if you have any suggestions, uh, contact us through this email on the slide. And, and especially if you have any suggestions for topics uh, and, and speakers, uh, please do let us know. Uh, and now I would like to invite uh, uh, Professor Nalindi Silva, head of the Department of the uh, University of Colombo, uh, to deliver a of thanks for the talk today. Uh, thank you, Vasundara, for inviting me to give the word of thanks. And before I uh, formally um, uh, thank uh, the speaker, I have to tell you, Binod, you addressed that uh, the, the leadership points very clearly. I mean, Sri Lanka, I mean, we can 
I would probably suggest that we will, at some point that you will give that talk to the, if you are in Sri Lanka, we can live audience, you know, perhaps the young leadership that uh, in the department also, we have the budding scientist, you know, so you articulated nicely about the, the, the difference between a leadership and, uh, you know, the just, uh, just administrator, you know, where, uh, especially when you have the, the, the education background you studied in Sri Lanka and um, you know you are all achievements it's icing on the cake but the cake was baked in Sri Lanka you know so um, and that is the that's the strength that you have and um, it was really nice that your experiences you shared and it's really inspiring to our younger generation I think the 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 middle career uh, you are talking about you are talking about the middle career leadership and uh, I mean, this will be really useful for a, a wider community in the our university system because you know uh, where the the leadership matters. That uh, you you really explain that um, you know the problems arises COVID nineteen and when when really uh, hardships occur, then the, the the leadership is very important. That um, and thank you very much for that inspirational talk. And I also learned a lot of things from you, do we know? And uh, thank you for compliments also during your talk uh, uh, to discuss something that uh, we are doing in the chemistry department and so again thank you very much for your uh, your valuable time spending valuable time and giving this wonderful talk for the audience and we had a lot of uh, students joined and uh, unfortunately they couldn't get into the zoom link and uh, because of the limitations uh, but um, we we had uh, just passed out graduates and also uh, the the uh, final year graduates and the third year graduates as well, undergraduates as well. So, I mean, it will be an inspirational um, uh, take home message uh, from uh, one of the, you know, the leading scientists in the pharma industry. Thank you again. And um, thank you very much, Kapsa, Vikum, and Sachit, and uh, Professor Tilakaratna is there, and uh, um, Reshan and Vasundara all your effort to uh, bring this um, uh, distinguished uh, speaker series. That is really wonderful. Yeah. So thank you again for uh, addressing uh, very uh, timely topics and uh, um, giving the, the knowledge and you share the knowledge of the experienced people with uh, our community. Thank you very much. And also uh, um, thanking the COPS again for supporting the uh, the the faculty of science uh, uh, all departments yeah thank you and also the uh, I want to thank the audience also we have uh, our our uh, staff joined today and also our chemistry special so chemistry students and the pharmacy students and all other specialty programs um, students and also the um, people who join through the the YouTube and the Facebook uh, as well yeah. So again, um, thank you very much. And we look forward to another uh, 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 talk like this here. Thank you again and all the best for Kapsa. And we hope to keep in touch with you and continue to work with you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Nalinda Silva. Um, so we especially would like to thank uh, Chemical Society of uh, University of Colombo who worked in collaboration with us uh, to bring this talk to you and also uh, to uh, especially to take the message to the students. Um, so we'll take a quick look back uh, into our year 2022. All right, so we have come to the end of uh, today's seminar and also the last seminar of the year. Uh, we are glad that we were able to bring and present five uh, distinguished speakers uh, to you this year who are experts in their fields. Uh, we started off the CAPSA Distinguished Speaker Series in April 2022 with a wonderful talk by Dr. Naling Samarsingha. And then we had Dr. A.P. De Silva in July. <coughs> 
Dr. Jaini Hitibandaralake in August, and Dr. David Hoskin in September, and Dr. Binod De Silva, last but not definitely the least, who presented today as the last speaker of the year. <clears throat> uh, we are hoping to be back in 2023 with another set of diverse, informative, and interactive uh, sessions. So on behalf of CAPSA, I would like to thank you all for joining us uh, and our seminars in 2022. And I invite you to join with us uh, in 2023 with more seminars. We now will be concluding our session for today. And uh, thank you for joining and stay tuned uh, for our next year seminars. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, sir. Thank you, Sajit. Thank you, Professor Silva. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Great, great talk. Thank you, you know. Thanks, Ekum. Thank you. Bye, Nalin. You know, he was muted. So okay, bye, sir. Bye, uh, nice to see you. And it was Roy nice to see you guys. is also here. Right. Okay. Here. okay. Nice yeah. to see you. And He's great talk. Uh, great <laughs> talk. Uh, we not very informative. And uh, yes. even I learned quite a lot from you. <laughs> yeah. Really yeah. nice. Yes. Inspiring. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Good, good night.